Before we begin this very special episode of the Parsha podcast, Parsha Noach, I have an important question for you regarding the format of year seven of the Parsha podcast. I need, I need your input. So as I mentioned last week, we're going to have three weekly episodes. On Sunday, the rebroadcast that covers the whole Parsha. On Tuesday, the episode from two years ago from 5781. And then the new episode on Thursday, the one that you're listening to right now. But I was chatting with my dear friends, Bill and David. These are two friends who are longtime listeners of the Parsha podcast and people whose counsel I greatly value. And both have been listening for some time now. And both heard the episodes from 5781 from the 5th year of the Parsha podcast two years ago. And they thought that maybe it was a bit too much to have every week two old episodes and one new one. And their concern was that it's kind of a lot to ask people to listen to three weekly episodes, and then putting out three weekly episodes may cannibalize some of the newer episodes. And they thought, they suggested, maybe we should stick to two weekly episodes that we broadcast and the brand new one. And you know what? If someone wants to listen to the older shows, they could search through the archives. So I don't know. Is Is there an appetite for the extra weekly show. And if it's labeled clearly as 5781, someone could skip it. But I'm not so sure now. I understand the concern. Maybe there's a little bit of confusion. Maybe there's some information overload. So I decided that even though I'm the autocratic dictator of this little fiefdom called the Parsha podcast, in the spirit of of the upcoming elections, both in Israel and in the United States, maybe I would allow for a little a little dash of democracy here on the Parsha podcast. So I created a survey. And the survey you'll find in the description of the podcast. It's only one question. It's a simple vote. Should we keep the schedule of three weekly Parsha podcast episodes, the rebroadcast on Sunday, 5781 from two years ago on Tuesday, and the new one on Thursday? Or maybe it's a bit too much. Two weekly episodes is the right amount. Don't worry about me being offended. I just really want to know what people want. You know, I want to better serve the audience. And if it's too much, maybe we just keep, we'll stick to two. We're going to have a vote. I want to make it the best experience for you. One question. Look in the description of the podcast. Submit your answer to the survey. I'll let you know next week what the results are. I'll put a little box there so you can add some comments if you want to opine a bit more about it. But let me know, should we keep this format? Should we go back to last year's format where it's just two weekly episodes, the rebroadcast and the new one? Let me know. And as always, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. We're going to start off this very special episode on Parshas Noach by asking two fish-related questions. And we'll use that as a springboard to develop an idea that I think gets to the heart of Noah's greatness and to the lesson that we're supposed to draw from the story of Noah and the flood and the Parsha. As you may or may not know, I don't, uh, I don't eat fish. But that doesn't mean that we can't talk about the fish. In the Parsha podcast, you know, as a yeshiva student, before you have your own, your own house, you have to go to other people for meals. That was the custom in Israel. And the yeshiva, they, they did offer food in the yeshiva in the dormitory, in the lunchroom, but it was more common to, you know, people to find friends who would invite them for meals. And everyone would always say, well, oh, you have to try my fish. It's the best. It's not fishy. It tastes like chicken. You always say, you know, the, the best compliment you could give to fish is that it doesn't taste, it doesn't taste fishy. It's interesting. In the halacha, it talks about how it's important to eat fish on Shabbos. But the halachic commentators add, if you don't like fish, then it's not necessary to eat it on Shabbos. They don't say it about steak. They don't say it about a nice salad or some pizza, only fish. But to demonstrate that it's not personal, 
we're going to open up this Parsha podcast with two fish-related questions. So our Parsha begins with the decay and the downfall of humanity. There's corruption, there's crime, there's very inappropriate behavior. And the fourth verse of our Parsha, this is 6, 12 of Genesis, God saw the land and behold, it became corrupted. And all flesh corrupted their path on the land. And Rashi tells us that all flesh corrupted their way on the land. The corruption was not limited to humanity. It extended to all flesh. Rashi tells us even the domesticated animals, even the non-domesticated animals, even the birds were interbreeding, were breeding with animals that were not of their kind. And that was corruption because the Almighty designed that there should be different species and everyone should mate with their kind and there was corruption. The Talmud tells us, in fact, that uh, the, the people before the flood, they would take the domesticated animals and breed them with the undomesticated animals and man, even man, the Talmud tells us, was with every animal and every animal was with man. Really, really uh, repulsive behavior of the generation of the flood. But again, it's not limited to, to humans. The Midrash tells us it was, it was the uh, animals as well. And they went against the way that God created the world. The Midrash says they would breed the horse with the donkey and the donkey with the horse. And the snake, this is an actual quote from the Midrash, the snake with the bird and the dog and the wolf and the rooster and the peacock, but conspicuously absent from all this corruption is fish. Rashi's examples, the Midrash, the Talmud's examples are all about domesticated animals, undomesticated animals, birds. What about fish? So in fact, one of the commentaries, the Chistuni says, there was one kind of animal, namely the fish, that they did not behave in a corrupt fashion. And in fact, only the land-based animals died. Quotes a verse later on in the Parsha, all the animals that were on the land died. But all the fish survived the flood. And the reason why is because only the land-based animals had become corrupted. Noah had a, had a boisterous menagerie on the ark. All kinds of animals. But there were no fish tanks. Why? Because the fish, they survived and they thrived outside of the ark. And the reason why is because they didn't sin. They were not corrupted. All the flesh, all the animals, the domesticated animals, the birds, the undomesticated animals, they all became corrupt. All the flesh became corrupt. But the fish didn't sin, weren't corrupt, and thus were spared from the ravages of the flood. So here's the first fish-related question. Why? Why were the fish unaffected by the corruption that permeated the whole world and thus were unaffected by the destruction that that corruption wrought. All the animals, all the flesh, the verse says, all flesh became corrupt. Men, women, maybe even children, apparently, all flesh, animals, all kinds of animals. There was corruption universally. But the fish, they were unaffected. And the question is, why? Question number one. Question number two, also relating to fish. After the flood, there was a big change in the diet of humanity. This is chapter 9, verse 3. God tells Noah, all the animals are now fair game. You can eat them, like the vegetables, like the produce, like the fruits of the field, like the plants. You could eat it all. And the commentaries tell us, the Talmud talks about this, Rashi talks about this in last week's Parsha. Adam, 10 generations before Noah, Adam was barred from eating meat. He had to be a a vegan, vegetarian. There's a discussion whether or not Adam was allowed to eat meat from roadkill, meaning from from an animal that he did not kill. But clearly he was barred from hunting and killing animals for his own consumption. And 10 generations later, after the flood, Noah, the rest of humanity, subsequently, 
They're allowed to eat meat. Okay, why? What's the change? Why was killing an animal to consume its meat originally prohibited before the flood? And then after the flood, it became permitted. So the Ramban explains, this is the Ramban in chapter 1, verse 29. He says, listen, you know, animals, they feel pain. And they're somewhat similar to humans in that they are very concerned with their own well-being and their own life, and they don't want to die. And they flee from pain and death. And therefore, why should you be allowed to cause them pain and to kill them, to consume them? That's the way it was before the flood. But then there was corruption. And the corruption was not limited to the humans. The animals sinned as well. Quotes the verse, the fourth verse of our Parsha. All flesh became corrupted. And there was a decree that all the animals should die in the flood. And why were the animals spared? They were only saved due to Noah. Noah was responsible for saving all the animals and for ensuring the perpetuation of those species. And because of Noah saving all the animals, he was given the perk. He was endowed with the right for him and his descendants to kill them and eat them. They're only surviving because of him. And therefore, if he needs it for his own food, for his own nourishment, for his own sustenance, he is allowed from Noah onward, after the flood onward, he's allowed to kill the animals for his consumption. That's what the Ramban tells us in chapter 1, verse 29 of Genesis. Before Noah, it was just veggies, grains, produce. It's an entirely plant-based diet. They were not allowed to eat, or certainly not allowed to kill the animals to eat them. But now, thanks to Noah, they're also allowed to eat meat. They all deserve to be made extinct, but no, but Noah saved them. And thus, their existence is solely due to Noah and to humanity, and therefore, Noah and his descendants were granted the right to kill the animals, to consume them. But here's the question. Why was Noah allowed to eat fish? If the only reason why, again, this is what the Ramban tells us, if the only reason why Noah merited to move humanity from a plant-based diet, it's because all the animals sinned and they all deserve to die. But Noah saved them. And therefore, he gains some rights over them. What about the fish? The fish never sinned. The fish didn't need Noah to be saved. There were no fish aboard the ark. And therefore, the question can be raised. Why was Noah allowed to eat fish? Why is humanity allowed to eat fish? Now, as I mentioned earlier, this would not affect my diet. But I'm coming after yours. No salmon. No Chilean sea bass. No sushi. You can have vegetarian sushi, sure. You can have your bagels with cream cheese, with butter, but no lox, no tuna fish. I'd be very happy. Why are you even allowed to eat fish? That's fish question number two. And this question is discussed by the commentators, but we're going to suggest some novel approaches to these two questions. And of course, we'll use that, as I mentioned earlier, as a springboard for understanding Noah and his greatness and maybe his shortcomings as well. We have two questions. Let's probe the subject. Let's start off with a basic question. The animals were told began to interbreed. Hishchis kolbasar, all flesh, became corrupt. Why did the animals interbreed? Why did they behave in a way that's contrary to their nature? You know, humans, we understand. Humans, we have free will. We have the evil inclination. We have the good inclination. We have the body. We have the soul. We're this complicated mix, and therefore some of us make good choices and ascend and bring the world up and become righteous and moral and kindly and good people, moral people, ethical people, upstanding people. 
And some of us, humanity, we tend to make bad choices as well. And some people make really terrible choices. Some people advance the cause of humanity and are committed to the benefit of others and want to be good people, want to work on themselves, to develop themselves and refine their character. And others allow themselves to become you know, more debased and devolve into immorality. That's the story of humanity. So it made sense to me that humans could descend to such low points, to such nadirs, that the behavior of the people before the flood can happen amongst humans. There's theft, there's robbery, there's idolatry, there's immorality, there's adultery, there's rape, there's murder. It's a terrible place, terrible place. Humans are capable of that. Get it. But what about the animals? Animals, we don't believe, have free will. And they ostensibly should follow the laws of their nature. What happened to contribute to the corruption of the animals? This is a famous question, and it's discussed in many places. And the answer that I would say is the consensus answer, it's featured in a wonderful essay from the Beis Halevi, and we're going to give it a little bit of our own spin based upon a comment from Ramchal. And this is the idea. Animals, in fact, don't have free will to make ethical choices and to become corrupt and to sin. They don't have that included in the suite of characteristics bestowed to them by God. But humans do. And the choices of humans affect not only them, but their environment. And if a human makes a choice to become more corrupt, whether it's a conscious choice, whether it's just the absence of a, of a better choice, and they lapse into it, because that's really the default state of man, mankind, those choices will affect not only them and their soul and their body and their spiritual existence, it will affect the people around them. It will create an atmosphere of corruption around them. And that will actually spill over to the non-human parts of the world. The animals, they became corrupt. Why did they become corrupt? Not because they have free will to make poor choices, but because they were affected by the humans. The humans became so immoral, so unethical. They did things that were so contrary to the will of God. That spilled over to the animals. The animals were less affected by the humans and began to interbreed and behave corruptly. That's the idea featured in the essay from the Beis HaLevi. The Ramchal explains the mechanism. What's the mechanism wherein the immorality of the humans bleeds over to the animals? So he tells us, this is in Derech Hashem, all things in this world are governed by spiritual forces in the spiritual world. So for example, the Talmud tells us, every blade of grass has an angel appointed over it that oversees it and strikes it and tells it to grow. The blade of grass is in our world. Houston doesn't have the, the nicest grass. It's one of those things that you miss from the northeast. Northeast, when it's not snowing, and it's not the miserable winter, really nice, luscious green grass. Here it's kind of, I don't know, it's a little yellowish. It's like thicker stalks. But a grass is... A blade of grass is a feature of this world. Talmud tells us that it's in this world, but it has an angel assigned to it. Meaning that these worlds, the spiritual realm, the cosmic realm, the higher dimensions, those realms, those worlds are connected to our world. And our world cannot exist. The blade of grass doesn't exist on its own, independent, divorced, cut off from the world on high. They're connected. And the blade of grass only grows because it has some sort of spiritual force associated with it. And thus the heavenly world, it projects influence 
upon this world and governs it. So we've talked about this idea in the past. Every land, for example, every country, every region has an angel that oversees that land. And that angel serves like as a, as a filter through which divine vitality flows. And that's why every land and every region has its own unique character and personality and style because it's influenced by the particular angel assigned to it. And there's only one land that has no angelic filter and that's the land of Israel. But here's the kicker. Those heavenly forces are malleable. They can be altered as well by the behavior of the choice-bearing humans in this world. It's almost like the blade of grass is spiritually lower than the angel that's overseeing it, but that angel that's overseeing it is spiritually lower than the soul of humanity. And thus, what affects the nature of that angel? That's going to be influenced by the choices of humanity and the souls that humans bear. Thus, the angels, or the spiritual realm we can call it, that oversees this world and governs this world, they take their cues from humanity. Ergo, via man's free will, man can affect, when we say man, we mean mankind, of course, Man can affect the upper spheres, which in turn affects the lower spheres. Animals are governed by nature. But nature is just the name that we use to describe the spiritual forces in heaven that intermediate, that concatenate the heavenly influence down below. And those forces in the upper worlds can be altered, can be changed by the behavior of humanity. Humans, with their free will, they, in the times of the flood, in the antediluvian period, they made poor choices to corrupt themselves. And that spilled over to the upper spheres and thereby it changed the schemes by which the animals down below are governed. And thus the animals became corrupted as well. That's the deeper meaning of the verse, and every flesh became corrupted. How did they become corrupted? Via this circuitous path from humans. Humans make poor choices. That affects the angels or the upper spheres, and that, in turn, affects the animals. All flesh became corrupted. All flesh, aside from the fish. The fish were unaffected. Why were the fish unaffected? So here's the critical point. The attribute, the quality of fish is that they are in their own environment. They are insulated and inoculated from this world. They're underneath the water. They're unaffected by the world at large. They're in a different atmosphere. And they're operating under a different system, so to speak, unaware, uninfluenced, unaffected by the tumultuous maelstrom outside. That's the attribute of the fish. In fact, the Talmud actually indicates as much. Thus, the the fish, it was business as usual. They're living in their own world, in their own environment, And thus, they were shielded from the influence of others. They were not affected. They did not suffer from the influence that everyone else was susceptible to. In the book of Genesis, there are a few people that are blessed by being compared to fish. Do you remember where it is? Although at the end of the book of Genesis... Chapter 48, Jacob's about to die. And he calls over Joseph, and Joseph brings over his two boys, Ephraim and Manasseh, that were born before Jacob arrived to Egypt. 
and Jacob gives them a very dramatic blessing and he crisscrosses his arms. We remember that story. But the text of the blessing, this is in chapter 48, verse 16. He says, V'yidgu larov b'kerev ha'aretz. They should proliferate like fish amidst the land. We have learned that the quality of fish is that they're in their own little world, in their own little bubble, and they're unaffected by what's happening around them. And we see Ephraim and Manasseh, they merit the blessing of being compared to fish. And the reason we now know is because they, they were like the fish. They grew up in Egypt. And they were completely surrounded by the idolatrous Egyptians. There was an environment, there was an atmosphere. The zeitgeist of the time, of the location, was such that permeated idolatry. And they grew up without a, a strong support system. There, was, there wasn't Jacob, there wasn't the whole nation to fall back on. They're completely surrounded by all these forces, yet they maintain their righteousness. They maintain their purity. They were not influenced at all by everything that was around them. And Jacob is revealing to them by giving them the blessing of comparing them to, to the fish, how they managed to do it. They did it by sequestering themselves and insulating themselves from the world around them. They were like the fish, hence they merited to be blessed to proliferate like fish. That's the attribute of fish. They live in their own world, unaffected by all the nonsense and all the chaos and all the turmoil and all the mishagas that happens outside their bubble. The Talmud, in fact, tells us of the concept called ayin hara, the evil eye. This is some sort of mechanism by which someone is affected negatively by the eyes of others, Talmud says, the descendants of Joseph don't need to worry about this because they're like the fish. The designs, the schemes, the plans, the negative feelings that someone else has, it doesn't penetrate their bubble. It doesn't enter their atmosphere. So we asked a few questions. Question number one is, why did the fish not sin? We know the answer now. The attribute of the fish and why they were completely unaffected by all the swirling corruption that affected everyone else. Now we know the answer. The quality, the the spiritual attribute featured in fish is such that it creates its own little protective bubble. And everything that's happening outside the bubble does not affect what's happening inside of it. And that's why the fish were spared from the corruption. They got everyone else, all other things. I think we could take this a step further. There was someone else besides for the fish that maintained their righteousness in the period before the flood. That's Noah. How did Noah maintain his righteousness? How did he, he alone, in an entire cesspool of corruption, how did he preserve his righteousness? Why did the corruption that permeated all strata of the world, above the sea level, of course, all humans, even all animals were affected, why did it not touch Noah? How did he remain a tzaddik tamim, a perfect tzaddik in his generation. This is a generation that got everyone, everyone succumbed to the influence of the corruption. How did Noah stave off those noxious spiritual winds that ensnared everyone else? Perhaps you can say that Noah too was like a fish. He too perfected the art of cloistering himself in his own little bubble, his own little hermetically sealed cocoon. And he walled himself off from the crazy world around him. He adopted the quality of a fish. 
He locked himself up in his own little world, cut off and estranged from the world outside of him. Like the fish, just totally unaware. Doesn't care what's happening on land. Know what was like the fish. And by severing his ties to the outside world, he created for himself this environment wherein none of the corruption can seep in. There was influence of the sinners that permeated and proliferated every part of the world. Only only the fish survived. The actual fish, of course, and Noah, who adopted their attribute. In Egypt, many centuries hence, Joseph, together with Ephraim and Manasseh, they did the same thing. And that's how they managed to preserve their righteousness amidst the idolatrous atmosphere of Egypt. We asked a second question. Why was Noah allowed to eat the fish? When Noah emerged from the ark, he was permitted to eat meat and fish. Meat, the Ramban tells us, because he saved them. They were all supposed to die, and only thanks to Noah did they survive. And therefore, he was awarded the right to consume them. What about the fish? Perhaps we can suggest that there was a second reason why Noah was allowed to eat the fish. And that is because he maintained his righteousness due to his embodiment of the attributes of those fish, of the sea life, that granted him the right to eat them going forward. Noah managed to survive the onslaught of corruption by personifying, quite literally, the positive quality of fish, by cordoning himself off from the outside world. And in the merit of that fish-like behavior, Noah earned the right to eat fish going forward. Now, if you open up the first comment of Rashi to our Parsha, you'll see that the sages were able to find faults and flaws in Noah. We've talked about this in the past. There's been like a tradition to pillory Noah. The sages do it, and we have not uh, withheld from doing that on the Parsha podcast. Noah, he's righteous. <laughs> he's the only person that the Torah calls a tzaddik, righteous. But it was only in his generations. He wasn't anything compared to Abraham, certainly not to Moses. I want to go a little bit gentle on Noah this year, but I think perhaps we can extend the quality of Noah and to see his greatness, but also find the area in which it was not perfect like Abraham and Moses and Moshe. Noah is negatively compared to Abraham and to Moshe. And the Talmud and the Midrash point out that Noah had 120 years to build the ark with foreknowledge of the pending flood. And he was supposed to use his time to persuade the generation to amend their ways, to try to clamp down on all this corruption. And he was completely unsuccessful. The only inhabitants of the ark, the only human inhabitants was Noah, of course, and his direct family members. Abraham was similar to Noah. He was rooted in the same faith as Noah. But he was able to influence everyone around him. He started a movement that ultimately numbered legions of followers. Abraham was not someone that was unsuccessful. In fact, he was very successful in having his ideals be accepted by the world at large. What's the difference between Noah and Abraham? Perhaps we can suggest that there is a downside to Noah's fish-like quality. Perhaps we can suggest Noah was so determined 
to wall off the noxious forces that were wreaking havoc outside of his bubble, that he truly lived completely in his own little world. And that's why he was of no help to the sinners outside of his cocoon. And that's where our sages find room to criticize him. In his praise that he was righteous in his generation, therein lies his criticism. He was righteous. He managed to stave off all the negative influences, but it went the other way as well. He did not influence to those outside of his little bubble. And I think that's the sweet spot. The sweet spot is to be selective in how you apply the Noah ideal, the Noah fishing quality, to wall yourself off when you are at risk of being a receptor for the bad influences of those around you. But to find room in your little bubble to jump on land, proverbially, as a fish. To find room to positively influence others. To encourage them to improve. To encourage them to reconsider their relationship with their creator. To encourage them to nudge them to become better people. And that's why Abraham outshines Noah. He too was able to stave off the negative influences of the idolaters around him. But on top of that, he was able to positively influence them for the better. I want to add another, in my opinion, marvelous observation. This is one of those observations that really could be its own podcast if it's developed properly. And it's an adjacent point to what we just said. I really should have, if I was more responsible, I would have saved it in my notes for next year. But what can I say? I'm just, I'm just too excited about it. I have to share it. We know Noah. He brought a bunch of animals into the ark. And most species, it was just two animals, husband and wife, male, female. But when it came to the kosher animals, it was seven pairs. Not one pair, seven pairs. This is chapter 7, verse 2. Noah brought seven pairs of kosher animals. Now, of course, Noah precedes Abraham by 10 generations. Abraham precedes Moses, Moshe, by six generations. And thus, Noah is 16 generations before Moshe, and thus before the Sinai Revelation. At Sinai, Moshe received the instructions, which are the kosher animals and which are the non-kosher animals. Yet somehow, Noah knows this 16 generations earlier. How did Noah know which animals were kosher and which ones were not kosher? That question is asked by Rashi in his comment to chapter 7, verse 2 of our Parsha. And he says, from this we can deduce that Noah studied Torah. Noah, even though he preceded Sinai, he was a prophet. And like Abraham, who knew all of Torah, who studied all of Torah before it was given, you may recall last year, Parshas Toldos, we talked about, we dedicated a whole Parsha podcast to this phenomenon of Torah that preceded Sinai. But just like Abraham and, and, and Isaac and Jacob, they had access to Torah prior to Sinai. Noah also had access to Torah prior to Sinai. And therefore, he knew that the donkey is a non-kosher animal and the camel is a non-kosher animal. And the cow, the bovine, is a kosher animal. And the goat is a kosher animal. And the pig is a non-kosher animal. He knew. And therefore he knew how many to bring two of and how many to bring 14 of. That's Russia tells us, chapter 7, verse 2. But it's interesting that the example of Noah's Torah 
is the differentiation between the kosher and the non-kosher animals. Let's compare that to Abraham. And this is an idea, again, we spoke about it at great length last year. The sixth cycle of the Parsha podcast, Parshas Toldos. We're coming up on a year, the anniversary of that podcast. Abraham, he studied and he fulfilled all of Torah, we're told. The Talmud, the book of Yoma, page 28b tells us, not only did Abraham fulfill all of the biblical Torah, any mitzvah that was added by the rabbis subsequently, new edicts, new rabbinic laws, new decrees, Abraham fulfilled that as well. And the Talmud tells us an example. He even fulfilled the laws of Eruv. Now, there is some debate and discussion as to what kind of Eruv did Abraham fulfill. And the reason why is because there's three types of Eruv. There's what's called Eruv Tichumim, which refers to on Shabbos. On Shabbos, once you start Shabbos in a certain city, you're not allowed to walk outside of the city limits 2,000 cubits. So you find the, the edge of the city, you add 2,000 cubits, 2,000 amos in every direction, and that is the border of the city. That's where you're allowed to walk. You can't walk past that. But if you do an Eruv Tichumim, that is a device that can extend the border of a city beyond the 2,000 cubit endpoint. That's one kind of Eruv. And then there's an Eruv Chatseros. This is also a Shabbos-related law. One of the 39 categories of work on Shabbos that we're not allowed to do is to carry from one domain, like a public domain, to a private domain, or a private domain to a public domain, or to carry an item more than four cubits in a public domain. But there's a device called an Eruv Chatseros, which unites a public domain into an individual domain, and thus it would permit the carrying of things in that domain, in that newly classified private domain on Shabbos. So you let to carry your child to shul on Shabbos. Well, you're walking through public property. And therefore, you cannot carry something more than four cubits in public property. Unless it's actually halakhically reclassified as private po- property by this Eruve Chatseros device. And then there's a third kind of Eruv called Eruv Tavshilin. This is when Shabbos abuts a festival. So let's suppose you have a festival on Friday. Let's say it's it's Pesach, it's Sukkot, it's Shavuos. And then right afterwards, you have Shabbos. Now, the laws state, even though on festivals we don't do any work, there are some exceptions. Namely, we're allowed to cook on the festival. So you're allowed to make a barbecue on the festival, but there is a limitation. You're only allowed to cook on the festival for usage on said festival. But you cannot cook on the festival for usage on Shabbos. And therefore, you would have to prepare for Shabbos on Thursday before the festival, which is on Friday. Unless you make this third type of Eruv, the Eruv Tafshilin. And that would be a halachic device that would allow you to cook on Friday on the festival for usage on Shabbos. These are the three types of Eruv that are featured in our corpus of law. And there are different opinions as to which kind of Eruv did Abraham maintain. From my research on this subject, I've seen sources that talk about all three kinds of Eruv Abraham did. He kept all of Torah, even the rabbinic law, even the Eruv. Which Eruv? These three kinds of Eruv. Now, what commonality do these three things have? The Eruv Tchumim, Eruv Chatseros, and Eruv Tafshilin. I think that the commonality is that they permit what would otherwise be forbidden. 
So they permit the cooking on the festival for the sake of Shabbos. They permit the carrying within the public domain on Shabbos. They permit walking outside the boundaries of a city past the 2,000 cubit point. And this is the example, this is the sample of the Torah of Abraham. Perhaps we can speculate. The example of the Torah of Abraham versus the example of the Torah of Noah, it's not random. Noah, the Torah that we're told about Noah, is the kosher versus the non-kosher animals. There are two buckets. There are two boxes. In one box, you have kosher animals, and those animals are kosher. It's fixed. And then you have the second bucket, and that's the non-kosher animals. And never shall these two boxes intermingle. There's nothing that you can do to turn a pig into a kosher animal. It's fixed. It's unchangeable. And maybe this typifies Noah's attitude. When he saw people, these people, they're corrupt. They're not kosher. And he viewed them in a way similar to the non-kosher animals. Just, there's nothing to do about it. They're, that's the way they are. Just like the non-kosher animals, it's helpless. It can never become kosher. He saw the sinners of his generation as being unchangeably non-kosher. They were irrevocably corrupt. Thus, over 120 years, he was able to corral exactly zero adherence to his cause. And that's why it's a very fitting example of the Torah of Noah. He had Torah. But what kind of really expresses Noah's attitude, the kosher versus the non-kosher? What about Abraham? Abraham he was the exact opposite. Idolaters came to his house. Idolaters that would worship the dust on their feet. And he would invite them in and give them a hearty meal and be kind to them and be very pleasant and deferential to them. And he would work tirelessly to persuade them to become believers. He would work tirelessly to influence them for the better. And thus, what's a fitting example of the Torah of Abraham? It's the era of which kind? Again, there are sources that talk about all three different kinds. Just because something is forbidden, just because something is against the will of God, it doesn't mean that it has to remain like that forever. It can change. That personifies, that typifies the Torah of Abraham. Someone is an idolater, they're not kosher. Okay. But they can change. The corrupt can be rendered righteous again. People are not condemned to be permanently the same person, to permanently be distant from God. That was Abraham's innovation. And thus, the Torah that fittingly embodies Abraham's outlook is the Erev. There's dynamism. That that is today corrupt, that that is today distant from God, can be made righteous, can be restored to God's good graces. So I think there are two lessons here. We have the lesson of the fish. The fish, like Noah, like Joseph, like Joseph's sons in Egypt, they show us how you're supposed to behave when you are surrounded by corruption. When you are on the receiving end of the potentially negative influence of others, we have the fish attitude. You're in your own world. You don't know what's happening on land. Whatever's happening there doesn't matter to you. And thus you can be spared. What about when you want to influence others? Then you adopt the Eruv attitude. How can I help those that are now not aligned not conforming, not compliant with the will of God, how can we help them? How can we wrangle them in? How can we reel them in? How can we help them? They could change. They could improve. They could ascend. They're not lost. The pig, nothing you can do to it can make it a kosher animal. Nothing you can do. That's it. It's fixed. That was Noah's approach. Abram says no. With enough 
love, with enough concern, with enough understanding, if I work gently with them, if I give them a hearty meal, I show them that I care about them, and I explain to them in a way that they can understand, I show them kindness, I show them divine kindness, they say, thank you so much for this amazing meal. Don't thank me. Thank Thank God I didn't make this animal. I didn't make the steak, this tongue with mustard that you just ate. It's God. God, tell me more about that. After a nice hearty meal and some good steak, tuna steak if you like that, Chilean sea bass if you like that, Abraham shows us what the Eruv attitude is. People are changeable. Things can be restored to righteousness. Noah, he was righteous in his generation. He shows us one half of the picture. Abraham is the complete package. Don't be influenced by the negative influence of others, but like the Eruv, allow your kindness and goodness and righteousness to spill forward and to influence others. That's the idea. The eye of this week's Parsha podcast. Let's get to the question, to the cue. Some questions are questions that we have to just appreciate and, and enjoy and savor and relish. Some questions we need a really good answer to. I feel like the question that we're going to talk about today, anyone who is fortunate enough to read the Parsha three times as we are instructed to do in the Talmud, This is a question that everyone asks in our Parsha. And it's not asked by us, it's asked by the Ramban in chapter 10, verse 5 of our Parsha. At the end of the Parsha, we read about the families, the family of of Shem and Cham and Yefes, and the whole genealogy and where they went and what they did. It seems excessively verbose. And it seems tangential. You know, we have to get to the to Abraham. That's Abraham appears at the end of our parsha. Abraham is who matters. Why are we going through all these sideshows? Why are we going off topic to all the other tangential genealogical lines? So the Rabban asks this question. He offers a series of answers. And then he quotes, which I guess that could be another cue question or a quote. He quotes an incredible Rambam that I found to be very interesting and I wanted to share with you. So he gives a few answers as to why we talk about the families of, of Shem and Ham and Yefes. So he says, well, Shem, we need to tell his family because he is the forebearer of Abraham. We have to know where Abraham came from. How did Abraham emanate, descend from, from, from Adam to Noah and from Noah via Shem to Abraham? What about Ham, Cham? Why do we need to know the history of Cham? Well, Cham, he does some terrible things after the flood. And his descendants are the Canaanites. His son, in fact, is Canaan. And we know that Abraham's descendants are going to acquire the land from Ham's descendants, from the Canaanites. We have to know the history of these people. And know why they are at risk of losing their land. It's due to the sins of their forbearer. And also about Yefes, Japheth. It's important to know the episode of the dispersion to explain the diversity of people and the languages and the lands that people live in. Moreover, he gives another idea. It's to show the divine kindness, even though the people of the dispersion, they really did deserve to have the same treatment of the flood to be completely destroyed. But to show us divine kindness, God kept his promise to to Noah to not destroy them, and that's the reason why we have to know that part of the story. So that's the Ramban's kind of answer to this question of why do we need to know all this extra stuff after the flood? Just right away, fast forward to Abraham, why do we need to know everything else in between? That's the Ramban's approach. Then he quotes an amazing Rambam. The Rambam says, it's just like a, like a, like a little idea, but it's a, a complete shift in perspective. He says that reading the genealogy gives credence, gives support, buttresses our faith. Abraham is 10 generations from Noah. 
But if you calculate the, the dates and the years, Abraham was alive to witness Noah. In fact, when Abraham was 58, that's when Noah passed away. Abraham and Noah met. They knew each other. The story of the flood. How many people do we need to rely upon to know the accuracy of the story? Think about it. Abraham met the actual people who were in the ark. If you want to figure out how far Abraham is from creation, there's only four people that separate Abraham from Adam. Noah saw his father, and his father saw Adam. So Adam, to Lamech, which is Noah's father, to Noah, and Noah saw Abraham. And Isaac and Jacob, they met people who were witnesses on the flood. And thus, Jacob tells his children who descend to Egypt about the story of people that he himself met. We think of it as hundreds of years and generations and who knows how these stories could get embellished and mythologized. Jacob met the inhabitants of the ark. And the people that descended to Egypt, well, Jacob himself went down to Egypt. So how far from when these events get documented in the Torah, how many different jumps do you have to to go? It's very few. It's only four or five generations. And that is not a lot of generations, not thousands of years and hundreds of generations. And who knows how these stories evolve and they change over time. It's a handful of people from, from Adam to Moses, to Moshe. There's two links connecting Abraham and Adam. Puts it all in perspective. We think about these events as, you know, it's it's so many years and so many generations and who knows what could have happened and broken telephone. You've heard that argument many times. From when these events happened, from when these people lived until Moshe wrote the Torah for us, it's just a couple of links. That's it. This is, to me, an incredible perspective. And I think we can extend it a bit further, you know, since Sinai. Since the since our ancestors ate manna for 40 years, how many generations is it? How many people do we need to rely upon? It's like they, they say, you know, John Tyler, the 10th president of the United States. He was a president for 20 years before the Civil War. Did you know that he has living grandchildren today as we speak? Grandchildren of John Tyler. (laughs) He was like a Whig, I think. The Whigs and the Federalists. We think of that as like a thousand years ago. He's living grandchildren, not great-grandchildren, grandchildren today. It's not so far away. How many generations since Sinai? It's not so many people. It's about a hundred generations since Sinai. It's not, to put it in relative terms, it's not so many. You put a room, in a room there's a hundred people, and that's how many people you have to go back until our ancestors were witnessing prophecy at Sinai, eating manna in daily association with Moshe. And if you assume that people on average see their grandparents, maybe even great-grandparents, it's 50 people of people that you see and who they saw and who they saw, and who they witnessed, and who they spoke to. Relatively speaking, it's not so many people. And I will tell you, we have a document that I'd be happy to email you. We have a document here. I'm actually looking at it right now in the Torch Center, in the glorious studio. We have a big version of it. We have a document titled An Unbroken Chain of Torah Transmission, which has the relationship of teacher-student all the way from God to Moshe, a Moshe to Joshua, etc. The names, the dates of people, all the way till today to the Torch rabbis here in Houston, Texas. You could trace, 
you're a student of Torch, if you're listening to our Parsha podcast, if you haven't already stopped listening a half hour ago, I know it's a joke from last year, but still, if you're still around and you haven't gotten disenchanted from the information overload of too many podcasts, how far is it? We could see in one document the names and the dates. And we know these people and we know their books. And we know the attribution of teacher to student, teacher to student, teacher to student, all the way from modern times back to Moshe, back to Sinai. This is an incredible quote from the Rambam, which again puts it in perspective. Why do we need to read about the ages and the dates and, and how old they were when they bore their children? Do some math. Abraham met Noah. Noah met his father. His father met Adam. It's not so far. It's not so far. These events are well documented. And it does give credence, says the Rambam, for us in our faith. I thought it was an incredible perspective. And it really raised my Parsha IQ. Hopefully also my general intelligence. I thank you all for listening. A reminder, find the survey. One question. I'll leave you a box there to make any comments that you want to add. Let me know what you think. I want to uh, give the people what they want. I don't want to ask more than is to be expected of you. Is two episodes enough a week? Should we do three with clearly labeled descriptions? What do you say? Let me know. Fill out the survey. Hope you have an incredible day. Hope you have a fantastic and splendid and terrific and uplifting and vigorously vibrant Shabbos upcoming. And please, God, with the help of the Almighty, we'll talk again in good health and in great spirits. Next week, as always, the address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com.